Welcome, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And as I said, we're now home until after the holidays unless something else unexpected comes up. But there were some things I wanted to mention last week that I didn't get a chance to. Uh, We were out in the uh, L.A. area. We gave a talk in Long Beach, and we gave one in Burbank. And my daughter's here with me, Julia. She's been on the show before. She travels with me everywhere whenever we're going on those trips. And it was fascinating in Burbank. uh, They don't use Hollywood anymore. The studios don't. And they have the studios now are all around out there in Burbank. But they said Warner Brothers, Disney World, Disney Land, all of that. Right. And mm-hmm. several other ones are out there in Burbank. So the hotel we were staying in, it happened to be where they shoot a lot of the TV shows. So that was an added bonus. We got to see them doing the filming. You want to tell them they yeah. were doing it right outside our our window. Yeah, right outside our hotel window, we saw two scenes from CSI, and then the day we were leaving, they were shooting a scene from The Mentalist right outside in the hallway um, from the restaurant. In fact, we had to walk through the set to get to the restaurant and to eat. <laughs> we were watching and and just kind of gogling over the stars. <laughs> so. But, you know, it, it's not like you think it is. They take a long time to film those scenes, and they do it over and over and over again. And that one night, they were the police cars driving up in the uh it was an alleyway down below where we were, we could, uh, like a bird's eye view looking down on the set, police cars driving in and out and for the uh, CSI. Mm-hmm. And they were doing it over and over and over again. <laughs> but I, I like The Mentalist. That's one of my favorite shows. So we were sitting there eating breakfast, and it's an all-glass uh, wall between that and the hallway. So we got to see the stars as they were walking down the hallway doing their scene. That was, that was exciting. I don't know his name, but he's the one who plays Mr. Jane on The Mentalist. And the woman who plays the woman detective were there. And so I thought that was exciting. Julia oh. said she usually doesn't see me get excited about things. But, you know, that's something different. <laughs> it was a nice little bonus. <laughs> There's a bonus to the whole trip, anyway, because you're doing classes and everything. It's the same thing over and over. So um, then the next week, I was only home for a couple of days. I had to go to Minneapolis to do the Edge Expo up there, and that turned out real good. So now we're home. So I knew after that I was supposed to go to Turkey, and that was postponed, and I was really glad. I wanted to stay home for a while. Okay, before we get going, let me give out the toll-free number if anybody who wants to call in can call. The toll-free number is 1-888-815-9756, 888-815-9756. But people are always saying, is that all you do is travel? Don't you ever get time for any fun? So it is nice to have something different. Sometimes we do have some fun on the travel. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes the unexpected kind like that Mm -hmm. one was. But since being on the Coast to Coast show, and that's been about a month now, Mm -hmm. we were on the end of October, everything has been so crazy in the office. We have just got, right after I went off the air that night, the phone started ringing and it kept it up for about a week solid anyway, two lines, one over the other. And now we're still getting calls, but it's slowed down some. Mm-hmm. And we had over 3,000 emails that came in. And if you did an email, just be patient. With a, a load like that and with us traveling, I do read them, but it's just way too many for me to try to answer. So we've been wading our way through them and you know, delegating other people to try to answer some of them. So don't feel insulted. There are just too many to do. So I have some that I will personally answer. But one thing I noticed is a lot of these people are asking the same questions and they're saying the same thing. 
So I decided tonight to go over some of these questions that the people are asking in the emails and just answer them on the air. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will help because it's amazing how they are the same questions again and again. I think we really hit something on that show with the Coast to Coast. We pushed a button Mm -hmm. in a lot of people, a lot more than we thought, and it is really creating something out there. Okay, for those of you who didn't hear the show, I guess I better give a little background so you know what we're talking about. Uh, This was a show where I focused on the three waves of volunteers that have been coming to Earth since the uh, beginning of the 1950s. (laughs) Now, I guess I better explain that. I'm not going to have time to go into all of it, I'm lecturing on this now because, to me, I think it's very important to have found these missing pieces. But those that have heard my show before, you know I've talked about the seeding of the planet Earth and how the, if you want to call them ETs, the archaic ones, whatever they were, who seeded the planet and started life on Earth way back, eons and eons ago, and how they've been taking care of us and watching over us all those years. That's why when I lecture at all of these um, UFO conferences, I always you know, portray them as very positive because that's the way I see them. I've not found anything negative in my 25 years of working with the ETs so, and doing the books that I've written about them. Some of the other investigators think they're negative, but that's because they don't have all the facts that I do. That's a caller already. Okay. Oh, yeah, is there anybody there? Yeah, hi, Dolores, this is Peter. Uh, How you doing? Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to you much last week. Oh, no, that's okay. I know I I was, uh, that was my fault. I didn't know there was a special show about uh, um, Star Child. uh, uh, Yeah, you you kind of jumped, you jumped the... You jumped the gun before I had a chance to introduce her, really. But, yeah, go ahead, because tonight I'm just going to be covering these. I'm just going to give some background so that people will know about the three waves. But go ahead. What, what did you want? Okay. Oh, did I interrupt? Were you talking about something with someone now? No. No, I was just oh. want to give a background about the three waves of volunteers so the other people will know what we're talking about. But go ahead with your question. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, does it have to be related to the volunteer, the three levels? No, just any anything you want to ask. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, after you wrote uh, Jesus and the Essenes, did you ever speak to a, a Qumran expert or a Essenes expert? And if so, at what length of time, or and what what or how much did you talk to them, and what was their reaction to uh, it, as far as how accurate? Uh, the book was and that regression uh, uh, to them since they uh, were at the Qumran or were they, you know, them studying the physical archaeology of it. I haven't talked to any of them, but when I was writing those books, I did a tremendous amount of research and I read every book that was ever written about the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything about Qumran And the ones who had done the archaeological digs, I read everything I could find on all of that so that I would have a background when I wrote the books. And I ended up that I knew more than the archaeologists had known because they had so many questions. And there was I think his name was uh, Padre Duvall. He was the lead archaeologist. And they always said that a lot of things he wrote about Qumran, he just, Um, didn't really have the answers. He just surmised. He guessed at the answers. And that has come down as fact when actually it wasn't. Later they found out that a lot of his things were not based on actual, his theories were not based on actual facts. And so really what we found was more accurate, especially the maps that are in the books, how it compared with the archaeological diggings. And I've never talked to any of the experts because, you know, they don't want to to admit about reincarnation, past lives, or any of that. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to admit that's a possibility you could take somebody back to when they were living in Qumran, especially when they were the teacher of Jesus. So there was nobody there that I could really ask. 
the only people I did contact were uh, Jewish rabbis, and that was for the other parts of the book, the theology. And I talked to them about some of the things that was mentioned in the book, and they said, I didn't tell them why I wanted to know, but they said, where did you get this information? We haven't even spoken of this in 2,000 years. So I was getting a lot of very hidden things. So, you know, when you're doing this, you really don't need a lot of proof. But I did find a lot of things were accurate. It's in the book. It explains the things that I've found. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been there? I know you did, you've done a lot of traveling. Have you ever been to Qumran? I've never been to Israel. No, I haven't been to Israel yet. I never know where we're going to go. We've been asked to go to Egypt uh, next March, and that's the first time I'll be going there. But I've never gone to Israel yet, so who knows what I'll find. But other people have told me, other people said they've gone, and they said it looks very much like what I've described. Hmm. You, uh-huh. With all your traveling, are, uh, which countries would you say are more receptive to the regret, past life regression uh, um, uh, well, I'm finding oh. it. I'm finding it all over the world. The interest is really increasing, isn't it? See, my daughter's yeah. here too. She can tell you the same thing. Yes, but you have different levels of understanding, probably. But um, I would, you know, we haven't been been everywhere yet. But um, everywhere we everywhere we have been, um, been very good reception. Very good reception. Yeah. And I think the interest in metaphysics and these kind of things is growing. It's more than people think. That's what we were surprised with mm-hmm. South Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the people there have books, but they hadn't had speakers come till now. And they're just really eager to know more, just like they were eating it up. Uh, so I, I don't think we found any country so far that have Well, been. no, because we're invited in. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they have to... Be into it. They already know your books and everything before, before for you to ever be invited in. So they and so it's already there. It's already you know. It's not like we go to an area and try to convert anybody or anything like that. So that's not what it's about right. anyway. So, but know. my books are in about. Their, their books are in over twenty languages. So they're always asking me to come and talk to these different places. Yeah, that's what I figured about. They, they were more receptive because they asked you to come talk to them. I know you weren't. Yeah. The, uh, well, you're always going to have. Have you ever been regressed? Well, definitely, yes. Uh huh. I know about eight of my own lives, and, and to me, I don't need it anymore. It's a tool. Oh, can you it's tell me about some of them? What? Can you tell me about this some is of your the past time or not? <laughs> But I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I know my association with my family, and you get to the point you don't really need to know anymore because it's just a tool to help you uh, with this life, and then you don't have to do it anymore. Julia knows some of hers, and I don't know if you need any more either, do you? No, um, because, again, it you have to put it into perspective anyway because um, you go through a point when you do it, I think in the beginning where sometimes the past lives become more important, and then you realize, wait a minute, this is the one that's important, and they are just parts that brought you to where you are. It's kind of like living in the past. If you were to constantly concentrate on things that happened earlier in your in this life and let them overshadow where you are now, when they're no more important, they are what brought you to where you are now. So it's something you get this understanding as you start seeing these things, and you realize how it create it has created you and how you've developed from that. Then now where we are, it's like okay, that's that's interesting and that's great. Um, we've kind of integrated all of that, and now we're moving forward. And so everything is about now and what you're doing to make you better and stuff all the time and so and, and to, to promote and advance yourself. So it it really takes a whole other um, perspective, I guess is the word. Um, it just it's just it's a it's nice, but it's not it, it's just a whole other view, focal point that you take on with everything. Um, you really kinda wanna do it like I'd like to do it again to 
see what it is that I'm I want to be working on now. I mean, the past stuff is is like I said, what brought me to where I am here. But now is what's important. And and a lot so, of the the work I do with clients that come to see me is to find if there's anything in their past life that relates to now that may be holding them back physically or mm -hmm. emotionally from doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's why it's a good tool, but you don't really need it once you have uh, gone past that. It's all about growth and evolving. Mm -hmm. Right. And once we've evolved past it, we don't need to know who we used to be. Does that make make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. If you have any physical ailments, uh, your past lives might help, uh, you know, explain mm -hmm. those and help you overcome yeah, that's, physical ailments. That's the main right. thing. I work a lot mm -hmm. with physical problems. Yeah, physical, emotional, any blocks, any things that you're having. If you're having problems, then that's where, okay, go go seek, you know, where it's coming from. It might be from this life. It might be from another life. But it's something that's bothering you, then it's something you need to check out. But, you know, but if you've got all of that taken care of, then then you're in a place now to go forward. So that's where you kind of know when, when you shift and the the. You know, you, you just kind of know that when when your past stuff is taken care of. <laughs> so. You call it the awakening. I guess so. Yeah. The veil mm -hmm. is thinning. Mm -hmm. I found a lot of people, their problems come from when they were children, things that happened to them as a child, and they buried it, and they don't even think about it anymore. But it sits there and festers, mm -hmm. and they don't realize that could be the cause of their problems today. So sometimes it's not past lives, it's things in this life. But, you know, that's what I work with anyway. <laughs> oh, But I know about eight of my... What? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, said okay. I, I, I know about eight of my past lives, so that's enough for me to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> were, were all of them on this planet or any uh, off-planet? All of mine were that I, I found. Yeah, maybe okay. you probably had some others, but you just weren't at a place to be made known of those at that point because yeah, that was a while back before you Oh, that was a long that, time though. ago. It was when I was first beginning is mm -hmm. when I did my own regressions. I probably possibly could have had a life on another planet. It just never has come up. But in my work, a lot of people have had lives on other mm -hmm. planets, other dimensions, mm -hmm. and it's that's what I write about, you know. No, and in some of your books, you mentioned you've never been unsuccessful with regressing someone. Has that reputation changed? Uh, have you come across anyone who wasn't regressible? Everybody can be hypnotized. Everybody. There's no exception. The only problem is those, I, I like to work in the deepest possible level of trance, the somnambulistic level. But we have some people who really don't want to be. You know, if you don't want to be, nobody can make you go under. And we have some who are control freaks, I guess mm -hmm. you would say. Those are usually men. Women don't usually do that. Well, but there's, we've had, I had a few. You can have controlling women. <laughs> I have a few, but uh, they're the ones who are, oh, they want to control the session. They want to be analytical and trying to analyze everything. And then they're over in the left side of their brain. And there's a lot of professions like that. CEOs, accountants, math professors are really difficult to use, to do. Uh, engineers, because they're, all they're thinking about is numbers and uh, analytical things. They're in the left side of the brain. We don't want them in the left side of the brain. You want them in the right side of the brain where the pictures and the creativity is. But occasionally you get some that that's their occupation, and they're much harder to work with. But you've got to remember, I've been doing this 40 years. I've been doing thousands and thousands of people. I've got a whole bag of tricks. And we can get through. We can get them there. It's just the matter of how much you're going to be able to get if they're going to want to control the um, session. But everybody can be hypnotized. There's no exception. Right, mm -hmm. to different levels. I mean, there's just... Yeah, some you know, of them won't mm -hmm. go down right. to the deep level. Everybody can go to at least the light level. You know, that is every, and everybody. So. Everybody. There's mm -hmm. no exceptions there. Mm -hmm. uh, are you still involved with the UFO community? or? or? Uh, well, I was an investigator for many years, but I'm not you know, involved in that way anymore. 
but I speak at all the UFO conferences. In uh, February, I'll be at the one in Laughlin. You know, that's the biggest one in the world. That's the UFO conference in Laughlin, Nevada. I'll be there in February. So I'm still involved in the investigations and things like that. And uh, you, do you remember, uh, how did you hear first about uh, that famous uh, kid in, uh, I think it was in Louisiana, James Leininger, the kid who uh, remembered his last life as a uh, World War II pilot that, the, his parents wrote a book about him. That was on the internet. It was. It must have been on the internet or on some TV show. That yeah. wasn't. That wasn't my case. Oh no no no! But uh, it was. I think I was. I think it was one of the most famous that helped. Uh, you know the world, the country know more about the power of, or the proof of past life. Uh, you know, well, there's of, many. Uh, there's many other cases that have been proven. But, uh, we, you know, people have found birth records, death records. They've even found their burial plots. Uh, there's a lot of this stuff has been proven. That's not the only one. But, you know, no amount of proof is ever enough for a skeptic. They will accept it no matter how much you give them. And then for those who believe, you don't need any proof. But um, there's been several cases like that where the person will remember details and be able to trace it back. And uh, have there any any powers that be or government ever tried to impose on you sharing of this knowledge? Because uh, you know, there's so much that you know that out there that uh, you've been able to come across that you know you know for instance the powers that be as you know in the folk community the government doesn't want people to know that there's life outside this universe. But you and I obviously know that from your the past life regression. Uh, world. Yeah. Um, has the government ever uh, talked to you about or anything like that? <laughs> Nobody about... bothers me. <laughs> I, no. We travel all over the world. We haven't had any problems with anybody. That's why I don't really put a lot of stock in that. Because, I mean, I'm more out there than a lot of people. And my books, some of them are very controversial. And uh, there's a lot of things in there about government you know, uh, pro- you know things that the government has been doing, but no, they've never bothered me, and uh, I don't expect them to, because I don't live. I live in the light. I live in the positive. I don't look for things to be negative anyway. That's not my life. So uh, they might be around, but they don't bother us. Yes, yeah. people <laughs> say they're at the UFO conferences and they're there, you know, to listen to the speakers and who knows mm-hmm. what to gather information. Mm-hmm. But if they're there, that's okay, but we don't get bothered. So that's the main thing. And I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, yeah. did any of your children pick up, like your daughter here, did she pick up the, the past life regression? Is she a past life regressionist? Did they pick up the career? Yeah, she knows how to do it. She has mm-hmm. helped with my classes, So she and she does cases. Mm-hmm. But go ahead and tell them. Well, I have. It's been several years now since I've done any because um, with all the growth with the business, I've just not had the time. But, um, yeah, I can do it, too. I mean, that's what she teaches all over the world, and, and anybody can learn it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you don't have to have any special experience or anything, just a passion to help people and to learn. So... And um, we're ha- the other students, and especially in Australia, uh-huh. and I'm teaching them all over the world, and we're getting lots of feedback, and they are having remarkable results because we have a website so that the students can communicate with each other if they're having problems and are to show their different results, and I think the results are phenomenal. Right. Mm-hmm. But Julia, um, she likes to deal more with energy work. Right. Yeah, what yeah, it comes more naturally to me to do energy work and distance healing things like that. So um I can do the other, but I I prefer to do the energy because it's very natural to me. So you know, everybody has different talents. But she works and you work in the energy field of the person or if they're at a distance too, you can Yeah, pick you just up. tap into their energy. That's all you do. Yeah, this is this is something that can be taught too. So there's a lot of things out there for people who are interested in these kind of things. 
Yeah, I, I have a background in uh, hypnosis with uh, helping people lose weight and uh, smoking. But does that, yeah, would that be enough to qualify me to, you know, take one of the classes like you had a couple a month ago in L.A.? Um, yeah, we're absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. They had, a lot of people take the classes. You're in what we call they do. They focus on habits. That is the lightest level of trance. I work in the deepest level. So we, if I do habits, I do it if the person is interested. But to me, I'd rather time travel. I'd rather go back into the past and find their problems there. But if they do want to stop smoking, lose weight, I put it in the session. But it's not the most important part. But if you're interested, yes, anybody who has a passion, even if they're not a hypnotist, if they Reiki, if they are interested in Reiki or energy work or just to have a passion to help people, uh, you're eligible to take the class. And we, uh, we're, have, we're setting up 2010 now. We yeah, have a few to... classes set, and we have some others we're just trying to finalize, and then we'll have them on the site as well. Where, so. do, you, where do you live? What state? Uh, New York City. Uh... So, oh, yeah, I got, have you ever been? Yeah, I just did a class there a few months ago. A few months. Well, it was toward the end, well, before we went to uh, around the world trip. I did the one on Long Island. Oh, okay. so, you, so do you think you'll be back in the future? Or well, I did one in uh, I did one in Newark. I did one in New York, and one on the last one was on Long Island. Uh. But they want me to come back, so it's a possibility. Yeah. Otherwise, we're we're looks like we'll have one definitely in North Carolina. Usually, we try to do something on the East Coast and the West Coast, and then in the middle of the country. So um, we've had several requests in the North Carolina area. So uh, that look, we thought you know that's probably going to be for sure over there. If we get enough interest in the New York area, then we will we can do go back another up. class there. We are setting up one in Hawaii and one in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And right. we always have two here in Arkansas. So mm -hmm. it's hard to tell them where they're going to be, but we're going to be going out of the country again, too, doing them in other countries. But if you're interested, Peter, now you don't have to give your name online, but if you're interested, you can contact my office, find out more about this. It's a three-day class, usually Friday, okay. Saturday, and Sunday, okay. and 9 to 5. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, LA one, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Uh, um, that's how many days they usually are. Is your daughter going to take up uh, the uh, business after uh, you, you <laughs> retire someday? Or we we think that looks like probably what's going to happen. She's, you know, we we kind of um, that's been asked a lot lately too. <laughs> Um, oh, if I was going to be taking over the business when you retire. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not anywhere near ready to retire. Yeah. And as you can see, oh, see it's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, it won't happen one second before she's ready for it to happen. So. <laughs> because, like I said, we're already scheduling at least four out-of-the-country trips this next year. And, you know, we're constantly traveling and, and working and running the, the, the publishing company and doing the classes and seeing clients. I'm, there's no way I can retire yet. <laughs> but um, well, yeah. when the time the comes, yeah, right, not yet. Yeah. What? Oh, the traveling's, uh, uh, it must make it interesting. You get to see so many different places. You've seen so many countries, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you probably heard me talk about the round-the-world trip we did in August and September. Russia and no, England. No, that was after. We went to Russia after we got back. The round the world trip was the first time we went to South Africa, and it was a tremendous reception there. So we're going back, and then we going we went on to Australia. We did England first, and then South Africa, and then Australia. And next year we will definitely be doing South Africa again, and we'll be doing Australia and New Zealand. We have a tremendous uh, following there in Australia. And we naturally we have Hawaii. So this one last trip was a complete round the world. Then we came home and I had to go to a conference in England, and then we went on to Russia. I teach there. A, a three day class turns into five days because with the translator. So 
there's a lot going on anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I, remember, I don't know if you remember. Uh, oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut well, I think the next year we'd be going to Romania, too. That'd be a first. Possibility. And then okay. Egypt. We always got some new countries, and they want me to come back to Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and maybe Japan and China. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a lot more traveling. Okay, what was you going to say? Oh, I, I just wanted I don't know if you remember in Keepers of the Garden with Phil, you asked him, uh, can you tell me of any you know species that I think it seemed to be uh, some sort of a higher self that had knowledge to ev- a lot of things, not just his lives, and you were able to ask anything, and you were asking him, you know, are there any species out there in the universe that uh, are not humanoid-type bodies like us humans? And he described yeah. the mushroom-type entity with nine uh, tentacles or whatever, and I know there was one that was a, a mechanical uh being that was more robotic and not biological yeah. that had a soul and was there any are there any types that you can remember that were non uh besides those that were non uh, humanoid many 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 they're in my convoluted universe books yeah. we talk about them they say some you wouldn't even think would be alive uh some wow. look like a triangle and you wouldn't even wow. think they were alive or like a ball but there, there doesn't matter if they have consciousness. It's just they are not well, humanoid shapes like we okay, are. Okay, well, but, but take that one step further. On Earth, like you, rocks have consciousness, your table, your lamps, your floor, So, and they're not humanoid, you know, so it's like it, it just, it's really, it's no, just because it's on another planet doesn't mean it's any different from us. I mean, it's all the same set of rules. Everything has consciousness. It's all following its own plan. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what we were told. One of the most important things people had to realize was that everything has consciousness. Everything. And once you understand that, you can relate to your whole world a whole lot differently, relate to nature, relate to everything. You can see it's much bigger than you think it is. And uh, in family gatherings, do you uh, talk about your your job, your career, your work? No. <laughs> no. no. We did. No, she tries and we cut her off. We said, no, we can't do it. <laughs> no, like yesterday, yesterday was Thanksgiving. We had 12 people here, and all we tried to do was keep the little ones in line. They were running all over the house yelling and screaming. And, no, everybody's talking about their kids, their jobs, their lives, and uh, they they know what I do, and it's not that important to them. <laughs> it's I think it's at the bottom of their list, really. <laughs> well, I mean, they're all, like you said, they all know. So well, when not, they yeah. hear we're going to go somewhere, they'll say, I want to go, I want to go. But otherwise, they don't talk about what I do. It, that's not the big deal. Yeah, it's old hat. Everybody knows what you do. <laughs> they, within the family, everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's not that important to them. I have a normal life, too, and I like to get away from all of that sometimes, you know. Of course. You have to yeah, balance. I already know. you got to have a balance in your life. Okay, what did you uh, what did you start to say? Well, uh, the, uh, the boy that or man that stayed in the tent in your backyard from Italy that you regressed to. Oh, yeah. Did you ever hear from him? No. But then I do so many. I do thousands and thousands of people. Sometimes they'll they'll email me back and tell me what's happening. Other times they don't. Sometimes they'll come up to me at conferences and say, remember me? And I'll say, I'm sorry, but I really don't. I see too many people. But, uh, yeah, I'll have a guy. He did come up here. And uh, he camped out in the backyard in a tent, and very rare for me to do that. I usually don't let anyone come to my house. But he had come so far that um, I let him stay here anyway. But uh, that's rare for me to do that. Very. <laughs> yeah. That was when we had that big storm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But uh, well, it sounds like you have read a lot of my books anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just read the Convoluted Universe. I just purchased from you uh, the number uh, three. Uh, I know someone that's uh, as a gift is getting me number two, um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that's why I had so many questions. I guess. Uh, have, but, have you read my last book that just came out? Five uh, lines. 
Five Lives Remembered. No, I didn't read that one yet. Uh, what, that just no, came out in that came out in July, and it was actually the first book I ever wrote. It was how I got started forty years ago. But in those days, it was so ahead of its time that nobody would publish it, and so it just sat until the time was right. Now we decided to bring it out. But it shows what it was like before anybody knew anything about reincarnation. They didn't know what New Age was. They didn't know what past lives was. There wasn't anything. And we were like pioneers. It just happened. So that book is my beginning. Tells how I got involved in the whole mess that I'm in. (laughs) Right. And some people are calling it her masterpiece. I mean, it's an excellent, excellent book. And we're thinking about making it required reading for the students because it and you would appreciate this as a hypnotist uh, already, um, uh, it really shows your parameters as a hypnotist, you know, what you can do and, and everything, because they were in the dark and and just winging it most of the time. And, and that's a lot of times what uh, people are afraid to do. They don't know how much of that they can do, so this is really showing you how much you can do. <laughs> because so. you don't have any idea. We had no idea what was going on. So... Uh, it's interesting in that way. Plus, it is we there was everything is in there that is now oh. in the New Age movement oh. before well, it was ever known. That's what amazed me was there were things that she's now writing about in the convoluted universe books, and she had them back there and didn't even realize it. We didn't know what we you had. know, and it was like, oh my gosh, it's been there all along. So we <laughs> had we have found walk-ins before the term was even invented by Ruth Montgomery. So it's, it's it's fascinating how we stumbled into all of this 40 years ago. So that's the new book. It's Five Lives Remembered. It's my beginning. Okay. Well, Peter, well, have you yeah. any more questions? Oh, well, can I ask uh, one more question? Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, I, oh, I just wanted to mention, uh, uh, similar to that, uh, you're, with you stumbling upon this, uh, you know, Dr. Brian Weiss, who was the chairman of a psychology for University of Miami was yeah. doing regression and uh, not regression, but just to earlier pe- in people's lives. He, and then all of a sudden, for years, he was doing yeah, it. All I, of a sudden, I, this woman uh, for ten, you know, that all of a sudden this woman he put her under, and she started talking about a past life, and he couldn't tell anyone. Of, he had to do this privately, secretly, because yes. he would lose his job. And yeah, yes, yes. then after see, he... See, oh, Peter, I, I know Brian Weiss. He's a friend of mine. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if you knew him. I'm sure you did. Yes, uh, and his problem was that he was a forensic psychiatrist. And he really took a big chance because he could have lost his job there. And I think he did because they said, who's going to believe a forensic psychiatrist in a court if they're gonna, they know they're into past life regression. So he really took a big chance. He's a pioneer. He was really out there. Him and Dr. Mack, those are the ones that took big chances in their careers because of what they believed in, and that's important. Stand up for what you believe in. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for your time. Uh... Um, okay. Well, was, right. you've covered some right. important right. questions. You had some interesting right. questions. Okay. All right. Good night. All right. Good night. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we got about another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, those were interesting questions, and maybe other people have read the books and wanted to know the same thing, so that's okay. Well, I was going to get back to what these three waves were, three waves of volunteers, and this is what has created the big stir, you know, on the coast to coast. It's My work is going in different directions. But back, you know, I said whenever the earth was created and the uh, people were seeded from outer space by the archaic ones who were ETs, essentially, but they went back eons and eons and eons back. It's back at the beginning of the world. Anyway, ever since then, they have been taking care of the people of Earth. They have been watching over us and watching our progress and our growth. That's why uh, that's 
Well, that's, that's why they're, yeah, they're here and they're around. <laughs> yeah, that's why they've always been around. That's why I don't see them as negative at all because they have been watching us since the beginning. But when we were created, it was supposed to be give this beautiful planet an animal with intelligence and free will and see what he will do with it. Because not all planets have free will. Very, very few do. They have different rules and regulations, and uh, this planet has free will. So they wanted to see what we were going to do with it. And over the time, whenever the species would need something, a gift, you know, a talent, a, um, what's the, what the word I want, the um, something they would need to progress. Yeah, the next step. The next step, it was given to them. And these, these ETs would come and live among the people so they could be there to instruct them. This is where your legends of the gods and the goddesses came from because these people could live as long as they wanted. And they, um, I'm kind of losing my track. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, I'm trying to push a lot here in, in a little bit of space. But, um, that part before that. Oh, the gods and goddesses. And, yeah, the and gods. They, came, um, they lived here among and giving the gifts. Yeah, and, the giving mm-hmm, the gifts mm-hmm. because every culture in the world has the legend of the culture bringers. These are the, the Indian woman, you know, in the Indian corn woman, in the Indian legends, the people who brought fire, the people that taught agriculture. These were all beings that came to help the people of Earth. And in the legends, they always come from the sky or from across the ocean, and they're here to help people. So these have been here all along. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever we need something, they can't live among us because there's too many people. So when there's an idea, the next invention that's supposed to be in our timeline, the idea is put into the atmosphere, and whoever picks it up, will be the one who invents it. They don't care as long as it's invented in some in our timeline. This is where so many people all over the world are always working on the same invention at the same time. I've talked to some in different parts mm-hmm. of the world who are working on free energy. So they, they don't care as long as it's invented in our time. So this is what they have been doing all this time with Earth, watching over us and giving us the next thing that we would need. I asked them one time, uh, isn't that interference when they do that? Because, I didn't say that, (laughs) because the uh, Star Trek directive of non-interference is very real. They cannot interfere in the development of a civilization. So I said, we're given free will, but isn't it interference when you come and give the people something? They said, no, that's not interference. We give them a gift one time, and then we see what they're going to do with it. And what sometimes they don't do the right thing with it. They'll use it as a weapon, or they use it in the way it was not intended. So that is, when you do it that one time, it's a gift. And then what you do with it is your free will. Mm-hmm. Well, then you, but then you ask them, well... What if they did use it in the wrong way? Can't you come back and tell them, no, that's not the way I intended it? Yeah, I got too much information uh-huh. coming into my head <laughs> at one keep time. you on track here. Yeah, so she's <laughs> got to get me on track. Okay. But they say, I said that, isn't that interference? And they said, no. If they come back and use it the wrong way, they can't come and say, stop it, because that is interference. To give it to you, what you do with it is your own decision, and that's free will. And a lot of times we don't do it in the right way. This kind of bringing up the Great League shortening this because in the lectures I go into a lot more detail. So they've been watching over us all this time. So at the end of the 1940s and the beginning of the 1950s, you know, it's when we dropped the first atomic bomb. And when that happened, they really got their attention because we were not supposed to have had that power yet. They knew if we got it, we were not going to use it in the correct way. And so they said, we better get down there and see what these kids are doing. What are they up to now? So when they did, they said, no, 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 they can't have this power. They could destroy the world. That's the only time they could interfere would be if 
if we were going to destroy the world because it would send reverberations out through space mm-hmm. and it could affect other planets, other galaxies, other dimensions, so it can't be allowed. So this is what they were worried about. We can't even take care of our own world, our own lives. We had just come through the Second World War. How, everything we were doing was horrible. The last thing we needed was to go into atomic a power. And what did we do with it? We turned it into a weapon. We always turn things into something that is negative. So they said, we're going to have to do something. Well, what are they going to do? They're bound by the law of non-interference. So they said they had a council meeting trying to decide, well, we can't go in there and stop them. We're not allowed to interfere from the outside. But mm-hmm. what if we could, if interfere is the same word, what no, if we in could effect, influence influence, yes. influence yes. from the inside? <laughs> mm-hmm. So they came up with what I think is an absolutely brilliant plan. They sent out a call for volunteers to come and help save Earth. And this, I lost my train of thought again, but they sent out the call for volunteers because the people who are on Earth, who all of these generations, had got so stuck on the wheel of karma going round and round and round, making the same mistakes again and again and again, They said they're not going to be able to do this. They can't pull it off. They will end up destroying the world. They were going to have to ask for volunteers, bring in pure souls, souls who had never been on earth before, souls who had never been caught up in karma. Those are the ones who could come and help save the earth. So they said they sent out a call for volunteers throughout the galaxies, throughout the universe, Come and help Earth. And that's when the three waves of volunteers began to come in. And I have done so many, many sessions now to where instead of going back to past lives, the person goes to where they were with God in the beginning at the source. They had never been in a human body before. Or they go back to when they were ETs on other planets or on spaceships or beings in other dimensions, even beings of light. They go back to those kind of lifetimes. And uh, they've never been on Earth, never been in a human body. And I don't know if it's time to go into what God and everything is, but maybe I can do that on the next show. Mm -hmm. But these are the type of people they wanted, those kind of souls who had never been caught up in our karma. So they asked for volunteers. So now, instead of going into past lives, these people are going back to where they were just coming in. And I usually ask them, they'll say it was so beautiful when they were back with the source, they were back with God, they didn't want to leave that, or they were quite happy being on other planets Mm -hmm. and other spaceships. And I said, well, if you you liked it so much, why did you come? They said, we heard the call. Now, these are many, many, many people that I've done and got the same information. They all say we heard the call and we knew we had to come and help Earth. Can I interject here? Yeah, okay. I'm getting... Okay. I'm getting to see what to say something. Okay. They really do. Because um, I'm trying to start. Um, we may have to continue next week. It, you okay. will. You'll okay. answer your questions next week and okay. everything. But... Um, I don't know if there's someone out there that needs to hear this, but it's really being impressed on me very, very hard. And I may be preaching to the choir. I don't know. But what they're saying to me is... And she always listens to them. And it's really important um, because I think people, and I heard it a little bit in some of those questions earlier, um, we we tend to do this uh, we and them kind of thing and make ourselves separate. And what they're saying to me over and over while you're talking is, they are us and we are them. We yeah. are all one. This is all one. And I actually I felt when you were saying the call went out and they asked for volunteers, and you're like, why did you do this? What they were showing me was like, well, if there's a part of you that's hurting, you go to help it. See, it's like, it's like you if feel we're it. Okay. We're all one. So you feel that and you go and, if you go and help. And so it's like 
it, of course you go. Of course, it's part of you. So, of course, you're going to do something. But it's like a really, really impressing. It's not an us and them. It's nothing like that. It's, and there's nothing to be afraid of. There's not these beings out there that, you know, are different from us. We're all one, and we're all the same, and we're all part of this whole big thing and and it's not an and, invasion because no, they have come and, into human bodies uh, right, no, these, right. these people <laughs> these people don't remember any of this consciously this is what's important about the three waves the first wave these are the people that i estimate being about in their in 50s, their 50s mm-hmm. or they and, might be some older yeah, and, and some I had, younger but it's i had a lot of people emailing me that say maybe i think i'm the first wave and i'm older but it, we figure it started you're probably a first wave <laughs> <laughs> well george jury said he knew he was uh-huh. when we were doing the coast to coast but i'm estimating it all began after the bomb dropping of the atomic bomb at the end of the 40s is when they began to come in well these people are coming in Oh, they don't consciously remember this. It only comes out when we're doing the session. But they don't want to be here. These are their characteristics. And I cover this in the book Keepers of the Garden. Right. And again in the Custodians, we talk about it. They don't want to be here. They say time and time again, I don't like it here. I don't like the violence. I don't like mm-hmm. the way people hurt each other. Uh, I want to go home. I don't know where home is, but I know it's not here and this very uncomfortable feeling of not belonging. And so when we do the sessions, we find out why. It's because they've never been here before. Right. Mm-hmm. And when they come in, the first wave, it's like they have a, a protective sleeve, I guess you would say, put around them so they cannot create karma because they don't want to be here. They want to do their job and get out. And if you accumulate karma, then you've got to stay. And some of these people, oh, oh, especially the first wave, they go into depression, and some many of them have tried to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Right. And they don't like emotions. Emotions frighten them, especially fear, anger. Those kind of emotions, they upset them because they are not used to it. But uh, we have the other waves, too. But let me focus on this one. This is the one we've been getting all of these emails. I mean, we had 3,000 emails, and I think the majority of them first were wave. saying, mm-hmm. I think I'm one of the first wave. And they're asking, do you think I fit in? And it's a tremendous response. Now, George Nury on Coast to Coast said he thought it was going to be a localized thing. You're just getting a few here and there. And I said, no, what we've been told, now we have reached the uh, the critical mass to where they said there's tens of thousands of these people who are on earth now, and they think now we have a chance of making a difference and turning things around. To me, that's extremely important. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and part of this, okay, it was, it was because of, to shift it around, but it's also about bringing light on to this and shining onto the dark. And as we've talked before, um, if, if you have the analogy of a dark room and you open a door where a very bright light is in the other room, you open the door, it shines light into that dark room, mm-hmm. and it also exposes everything that's in there so you can see it. You, when you open that door, the dark doesn't leak into the light. The light leaks into the dark. So... You don't have to have, we kept trying to figure out before how many it would take to get to the point where it shifts. It's not like it has to be half or three quarters or, you know, more. It just has to be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it doesn't have to be a large number, actually. And it shines because it doesn't take a lot of light to completely expose dark. And yeah. so that's why it has reached that point. Uh, uh, Probably sooner than we were thinking it was going to. Yeah, and it really it has tipped. It it is. It, I think it's tipped. <laughs> exactly. But the so. mail I've got is really amazing. I mean, people, even men who were answering, said I sat there and cried. I was on the air for over three hours mm-hmm. that night on coast to coast, and they said they sat there and cried because they said you're describing me. Now I know why I'm here. I know why I don't feel comfortable here. And it's amazing what we, the response we have got. And other ones said they couldn't believe it. They said, I almost 
fell off the chair, you were describing me. Mm-hmm. Now, this means there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people out there who don't want to be here, who don't feel like they belong. Well, they don't understand their, their thing, but they're... Can I make another message? Okay, you me. will know. <laughs> you know, and it may be by things like this, where you're going to hear something, oh, this is what I'm here for. But if you don't, you are going to know. That's what this is all about. You're, it's, uh, that veil we keep talking about is thinning and thinning and thinning. It's so transparent. Oh, my gosh, it's almost non-existent. And you're here for a definite yes, reason. And you will know why you're here. You will know what you need to know at the point that you need to know it. So trust yourself. Just trust that you are here for a reason. Trust that you have the answers. And if things get kind of crazy, you know what to do. You just know. You know exactly where to be and you know what to do. Okay. So don't let it get weird on you. (laughs) Well, I think uh, next week we're going to continue this because I had so many emails. I want to address all of this Mm -hmm. and I want to talk about the other two Mm -hmm. waves that came after the first one. But we're running out of time again. But if anybody wants any information, like Peter wanted to know about my classes, to go to my website, we have the classes, we have about sessions, mm-hmm. uh, any and we, any books, anything mm-hmm. you want to know, you can go to the website and find out. It's www.ozarkmountain, which is the name of my company. It is abbreviated O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Or if you're overseas, it's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Or if you want to call the office, it's 1-800-935-0045. Okay, and I know we're coming up to time, so thanks for listening, and we will continue this discussion next week. Good night, everybody. Happy holidays. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos And be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.